when I was six months old, we're in some little town, small hotel, and I fell down a full flight of stairs at the bottom, to the bottom. Meaning a fall, because that's the only time it was used. It meant a Bronco Buster or a fall. It was never used as a name. My father. Buster Keaton was a major, major. Yeah. I mean, when you think about Michael Keaton, Diane Keaton, Buster Keaton, <laughs> there's a lot. There's that name has been good to show business. During the vibrant era of the 1920s, Joseph Frank Buster Keaton emerged as a comedic force on the silver screen, leaving an indelible mark with his unparalleled slapstick and stunt performances. Introduced to the world of film at the age of 21, Keaton not only showcased his exceptional acting talents, but also ventured into directing and producing films in the ensuing years. However, the advent of talkies marked a turning point in Keaton's illustrious career. The transition to sound in cinema presented challenges for some actors, and Keaton, unfortunately, faced difficulties due to Hollywood's perception of his voice. Allegedly, industry insiders expressed dissatisfaction with his vocal qualities, contributing to a decline in his demand. Simultaneously, Keaton's distinctive and daring stunt work, which had been a hallmark of his success, became a source of contention. Rumors circulated that Hollywood executives were not enamored with his audacious stunts, leading to speculation that they sought to diminish his influence and appeal. There were even whispers of deliberate attempts to curtail his career, with stories circulating about potential injuries, such as the speculation that he might have broken his neck during a stunt. As the 1920s drew to a close, these challenges culminated in a substantial setback for Keaton. The decline in demand, coupled with the supposed disapproval of his voice and stunts, prompted a significant downturn in his career. Tragically, this period of professional turmoil had profound personal consequences for Keaton. Struggling with the challenges, he descended into the throes of alcoholism and depression, reaching a point where his well-being was severely compromised. The culmination of these struggles resulted in Buster Keaton's institutionalization. The man who had once blazed a trail through silent Hollywood and garnered acclaim for his unparalleled comedic skills found himself grappling with the harsh realities of an industry in flux. The question of how such a celebrated figure came to such a precipitous fall remains a complex narrative of changing industry dynamics, personal challenges, and the tumultuous intersection of artistry and commerce in the world of entertainment. The trajectory of Buster Keaton's career and personal struggles has prompted speculation about the impact of his early life on the eventual collapse of his Hollywood success. Raised in the world of vaudeville, Keaton's upbringing was marked by a unique blend of humor and physicality. His father, Joe, played a pivotal role in their family act, where he would toss young Joseph through the air like a football showcasing an act that prided itself on being both rough and humorous. The origins of Keaton's legendary nickname, Buster, are linked to a supposed incident involving Harry Houdini. According to Biography.com, after a young Joseph fell down a flight of stairs, Houdini exclaimed, That was a real Buster! This incident, coupled with Keaton's upbringing in a vaudevillian environment that valued rough humor, laid the foundation for his unique brand of physical comedy. However, the challenges extended beyond the stage. Keaton Sr. was reported to be a heavy drinker, and Marion Mead's 1995 book, Buster Keaton Cut to the Chase, delves into the comedian's background to provide insights into the demons that plagued him. Mead's work, as reviewed by Publishers Weekly, suggests that Keaton's father was not only physically rough, but also resorted to beating him at the first sign of fear. The review contends that Keaton sought refuge from his uncaring parents by venturing into the world of silent film acting. Nevertheless, not everyone agrees with this characterization of Keaton's early life. Bruce Levinson of Damphonos, the international Buster Keaton Society, challenges Meade's perspective. Levinson argues that connecting Keaton's on-screen character directly to alleged brutality by his father lacks evidence and may be an oversimplification. He notes a lack of indication from Keaton himself that his younger years were troubled and points out that knockabout comedy, featuring on-stage violence, 
was not uncommon during that era, citing examples from Chaplin and Lloyd's films. While the extent to which Buster Keaton's family life contributed to his overall decline is open to debate, it is evident that certain factors, particularly in his marriage to actress Natalie Talmadge, played a role in unsettling the once a seemingly indestructible comedic icon. The Union, initiated in 1921, encountered challenges, notably with Talmadge's desire for a separate bedroom following the birth of their two sons. Additionally, financial strains arose, with Mrs. Keaton reportedly exhibiting a propensity for spending substantial portions of her husband's salary. As Keaton's domestic life underwent fractures, his personal struggles were compounded by a significant blow in the realm of his artistic endeavors. Up until 1926, Keaton had enjoyed a period of total creative control over his property. Projects. However, the release of The General, in the same year, marked a turning point. This expensive Civil War set comedy, as described in a 2014 article in The Telegraph, faced challenges due to heightened expectations following Keaton's string of crowd-pleasing films. Reviewers grappled with the ironic treatment of North vs. South themes, contributing to financial losses for the film. The political undertones and relative failure of the general, combined with the advent of talkies in 1927, led Keaton to MGM, where he signed a contract in 1928 that significantly curtailed his creative autonomy. This contractual shift marked a departure from the artistic control he had wielded in the earlier part of his career. The contract ultimately terminated in 1934. These professional pressures, coupled with personal struggles, set Keaton on a self-destructive path. His drinking spiraled out of control, and in 1933, he famously married nurse May Scriven in an inebriated state, later claiming to have no recollection of the ceremony. Amidst these challenges, a glimmer of light in Keaton's life was his enduring friendship with Charlie Chaplin. Despite the myriad difficulties in Keaton's personal and professional spheres, his camaraderie with Charlie Chaplin remained a steadfast source of solace. The enduring bond between these two cinematic legends offered Keaton a measure of support and connection during a tumultuous period in his life. Limelight stands out in the annals of cinematic history, primarily for being the singular collaborative effort between Charlie Chaplin, a legendary star and director renowned for classics such as The General and his parallel silent comedy counterpart, Buster Keaton. The climactic final performance of Calvero, played by Chaplin, sees Keaton making a memorable appearance as his partner. In contrast to the often contrived reunions and character team-ups prevalent in contemporary pop culture, the meeting of these two iconic figures is executed with a seamless subtlety that resonates with the audience. The introduction of Keaton's character in the dressing room is marked by a quiet elegance, allowing the emotional weight of having two cinematic legends share the screen for the first time to unfold with touching sincerity. The cinematic bliss derived from watching Chaplin and Keaton perform a musical slapstick routine on stage is undeniable. Yet, beneath the surface, there lingers a poignant undertone as Keaton's presence adds a layer of melancholy to the moment. The significance of this collaboration goes beyond the joy of witnessing two comedic icons engage in a shared performance. The film captures the evolution of Chaplin and Keaton from on-screen competitors to collaborative partners, a transition that is especially poignant given the film's commentary on the fading stardom of Chaplin's character. The poetic nature of this collaboration is intentional, as the comedic timing of Chaplin and Keaton may not be as sharp and electric as in their individual heydays, but the resonance of watching these two giants of the medium bounce off each other would have been nothing short of dreamlike for audiences in 1952. In essence, Limelight not only serves as a testament to the enduring brilliance of Chaplin and Keaton, but also provides is a reflective and emotionally charged moment in cinema history. The film captures the essence of a bygone era, where two luminaries of silent comedy come together, creating a cinematic experience that transcends the mere novelty of their collaboration, leaving an indelible mark on the hearts of viewers. Now, let us delve into the life and career of Buster Keaton, a figure who, despite his immense contributions to the world of cinema, may have faded from the collective memory of contemporary audiences. Born on October 4, 1895, in Piqua, Kansas, 
Joseph Frank Keaton IV entered the world as the offspring of seasoned vaudevillian actors, Joe and Myra Keaton. The roots of his illustrious career can be traced back to his early years, as he was introduced to the world of entertainment at the tender age of three when his parents seamlessly incorporated him into their vaudeville act. The legendary moniker Buster became synonymous with Keaton's identity under unique circumstances. At just 18 months old, he earned the nickname after a purported fall down a flight of stairs. The story goes that magician Harry Houdini, upon rescuing the child, humorously remarked to the boy's parents, that was a real buster. This early anecdote foreshadowed Keaton's resilience and ability to endure, characteristics that would become defining elements of his life and career. Embracing the family tradition, Keaton became accustomed to the physical demands of show business from a young age. Engaging in an act with his parents that prided itself on a blend of rough and comedic elements, Keaton often found himself tossed about by his father. These performances served as a training ground for the budding entertainer, shaping not only his physical agility, but also cultivating the deadpan expression that would later become an iconic feature of his comedic repertoire. Reflecting on his early experiences, Keaton would later acknowledge the unique challenges of his family's act, stating, It was the roughest knockout act that was ever in the history of the theater. Commencing in 1907, Buster Keaton spent several childhood summers in Muscogon, Michigan, drawn to the area where his father had been instrumental in establishing the actor's colony. This locale had evolved into a sought-after destination for vaudevillian performers, fostering a vibrant community that served as a wellspring of inspiration for the young entertainer. Even in his inaugural film appearance in the 1917 two-reeler titled The Butcher Boy, co-starring Roscoe, Fatty, Arbuckle, Keaton exhibited his penchant for extreme slapstick. In this early cinematic endeavor, Keaton endured a series of comedic trials, ranging from being submerged in molasses to encountering the antics of an irksome dog. Despite the physical demands of such comedic performances, Keaton's passion for filmmaking remained unwavering. Over the next two years, he forged a close collaboration with Arbuckle, earning a modest sum of $40 per week. This apprenticeship proved pivotal, affording Keaton comprehensive exposure to the intricacies of the movie-making process. In 1920, Buster Keaton embarked on an independent filmmaking journey, initially producing a series of two reelers that included now classic works such as One Week, 1920, The Playhouse, 1921, and Cops, 1922. Demonstrating his artistic evolution, Keaton transitioned to creating full-length features in 1923, with notable entries like The Three Ages, 1923, and Sherlock Jr., 1924. Among his acclaimed works from this period stands The General, 1927, where Keaton assumed the roles of writer, director, and star, portraying a train engineer during the Civil War. Despite facing initial commercial disappointments, The General later garnered recognition as a pioneering cinematic achievement, solidifying Keaton's legacy as a trailblazer in filmmaking. Buster Keaton's early years in the film industry, marked by a blend of physical comedy and innovative storytelling, laid the groundwork for a career that transcended the boundaries of silent cinema, leaving an indelible impact on the art of filmmaking. Woven seamlessly into Buster Keaton's cinematic masterpieces were the distinctive elements that defined his comedic genius, his trademark humor, impeccable timing, and patented facial expressions. Early in his career, particularly in his two reelers, Keaton showcased a mastery of slapstick comedy, often employing iconic elements such as the classic pie gag. Notably, his films also featured a remarkable commitment to performing his own stunts, establishing him as a Hollywood legend celebrated not only for his falls, but also for his remarkable lack of injuries, a testament to his extraordinary physicality and precision. During the zenith of his career in the mid-1920s, Buster Keaton enjoyed a level of celebrity comparable to that of his contemporary silent film star, Charlie Chaplin. His earnings reached an impressive $3,500 per week, a testament to his widespread popularity and artistic prowess. Bolstered by his success, Keaton constructed a lavish $300,000 home in the prestigious Beverly Hills. However, the turning point in Keaton's trajectory occurred in 1928, 
when he made what he would later deem the mistake of his life. With the advent of talkies, Keaton signed a contract with MGM, Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, a move that ultimately proved detrimental to his creative autonomy. The transition to sound films saw Keaton relinquishing significant portions of control over his work to the studio executives. The consequence was a deviation from the distinctive Keaton style that audiences had come to expect. As a result, Keaton's life took a precipitous turn. His marriage to actress Natalie Talmadge, with whom he had two sons, unraveled, and he grappled with the debilitating effects of alcoholism and depression. By 1934, with his MGM contract terminated, Keaton found himself facing financial ruin, leading him to file for bankruptcy. Astoundingly, his listed assets amounted to a mere $12,000. The subsequent year saw the end of his second marriage, as he divorced May Scriven. Buster Keaton's journey reflects the highs and lows of a cinematic pioneer whose unparalleled comedic brilliance and artistic autonomy faced challenges in the evolving landscape of the film industry. The transition to sound films marked a pivotal chapter in his life, setting the stage for personal and professional struggles that would shape the latter part of his storied career. In 1940, a positive turn in Buster Keaton's life unfolded when he entered into his third marriage, this time with Eleanor Morris, a 21-year-old dancer. Many credited Eleanor with bringing stability to Keaton's tumultuous life, and their union endured until his passing in 1966. The 1950s marked a notable resurgence in Keaton's career, fueled in part by British television, where the aging comedian made appearances on several programs. A reintroduction to American audiences occurred as Keaton portrayed himself in Billy Wilder's Sunset Boulevard, 1950, and Charlie Chaplin's Limelight, 1952. Additionally, he elevated his public profile through participation in various American television programs and commercials. In a significant testament to his enduring popularity, Paramount paid Keaton $50,000 in 1956 for the film rights to The Buster Keaton Story, a cinematic portrayal of his life, albeit with some inaccuracies, tracing his journey from vaudeville to Hollywood. Simultaneously, film enthusiasts rediscovered Keaton's silent film classics during this period. In 1962, Keaton, who had retained full rights to his earlier works, reissued The General and witnessed the film's re-evaluation with awe as it garnered acclaim from fans and critics across Europe. This rediscovery of his silent film legacy not only reaffirmed Keaton's status as a cinematic luminary, but also contributed to a renewed appreciation for his groundbreaking contributions to the art of filmmaking. As Buster Keaton's career experienced a late career resurgence, his enduring legacy became increasingly evident, with audiences recognizing the timelessness of his comedic genius. His journey from silent film stardom to a revival in the later years stands as a testament to his resilience, artistic brilliance, and lasting impact on the world of cinema. In October of 1965, the zenith of Buster Keaton's late career resurgence was realized when he received an invitation to the Venice Film Festival. At this prestigious event, he showcased his latest creation, film a 22-minute silent movie crafted from a Samuel Beckett screenplay. Produced in New York the preceding year, the screening of film concluded with an extraordinary moment, an enthusiastic five-minute standing ovation from the captivated audience. Expressing his profound gratitude, a visibly moved Keaton declared, This is the first time I've been invited to a film festival, but I hope it won't be the last. The event underscored the enduring appeal of Keaton's artistic contributions and served as a poignant acknowledgement of his enduring impact on the cinematic landscape. As a testament to his resilience and work ethic, in the twilight of his life, Buster Keaton's career enjoyed a financial upswing, with earnings surpassing $100,000 annually, primarily derived from commercial engagements. Despite his advancing age, Keaton, who had been bestowed with a Special Academy Award in 1959, asserted that he had more work than he could manage. Tragically, on February 1, 1966, at the age of 70, Buster Keaton succumbed to lung cancer in Woodland Hills, Los Angeles. Remarkably, he remained unaware of the terminal nature of his illness. Having been diagnosed with bronchitis, 
in January 1966. Confined to a hospital in his final days, Keaton's restlessness was palpable as he longed to return home. Eleanor, his third wife, shared insights into his active demeanor, noting that he was out of bed, moving about, and even engaged in card games with friends just a day before his passing. The legacy of this cinematic luminary lives on as Buster Keaton found his final resting place at Forest Lawn Memorial Park Cemetery in Hollywood Hills, California. His indomitable spirit, creative genius, and enduring contributions to film continue to resonate, leaving an indelible mark on the history of cinema.